It is my pleasure to introduce Sam Watson, who is the Director of Graduate Studies in the Data Science Initiative here at Brown. Uh, many of you are already familiar with his work with the uh, Data Gymnasia, uh, and he has a, a newer uh, project that I know he's eager to talk about today. And so I'll leave it there and say, Sam, please take it away. Okay, so yeah, so I'm just gonna, you know, have this on the screen share as well. So if you don't join the course, that's fine. But yeah, so it's going to be, you know, sort of like slides, except there's more more interaction. And, and also because it's in the style of, of these messages, there will be more text there. So yeah, so th uh, thank you, to Professor Ritt for the invitation to speak. I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to see you all. Um, and I'm just going to sort of generally talk uh, about some specific data science learning resources. Um, and, and it'll be aimed at people, mostly who are people who are pretty new to data science. So uh, just a, a little bit of background about me. So I did my PhD in pure mathematics and I came to Matt, uh, Brown University also in the mathematics department. I was there for two and a half years exclusively. And then the last year of my postdoc, I transitioned to the DSI where I've been since 2017. And uh, I run the master's program and I spent a lot of time developing educational resources and, and content. Um, so tooling and content related to data science. So my main two projects outside of the, you know, my regular job are uh, Data Gymnasia and more recently Prismia. So the, the former is a website that is a sequence of data science sort of mini courses. I think courses is maybe a little too strong of a word here but they're designed to be uh, sort of worked through interactively, uh, individually, uh, kind of like reading a book, except it's, you know, it's web-based and it takes advantage of that medium, it's more interactive. And uh, that's built on something called Mathagon, which is a, a tool that, that's built really mostly for sort of middle school, high school math, but it, it's got the equipment there to do the, the things that we do in Data Gymnasia. Um, and Prismia is, is more of an in-house project. So it, it's kind of similar in some ways. Um, the idea though, is it's gonna be much more conducive for someone else to step in and produce content. Whereas Mathagon is really, uh, it's, it, it's harder work to build something and it, it's very hard to deploy. Uh, whereas Prismia, all of that's easy. So it's, it's, it's more for content creators in that sense. Um, and also it has a live classroom and asynchronous mode. So you build the content once and you can deploy it live in class or asynchronously. So you can see what the synchronous mode is like right now. That's what we're doing. And um, the asynchronous version, I'll, I'll send you a link to this very presentation at, at the end so that you can pull, pull this up later and, and get all of these links and see all of this stuff if you want. Um, even if you're not lo logged into the system. Uh, but the synchronous mode is, sorry, the asynchronous mode um, looks kind of like this. So it's it, it's similar in some ways, it's a chat style. You're gonna have the same kinds of interaction and stuff. Um, but when you answer questions, instead of coming to the instructor, they get logged in a database for the instructor to review later. And um, you can step through them, you know, whatever whatever pace that you want. Um, so this is just sort of a screenshot of one of my uh, presentations or, or one of my, they're called shared lessons. And um, yeah, so that they, they have, there are various features built in here that I don't want to get too far into, but it's customized responses to multiple choices, one of them. And we also have interactive 2D and 3D figures. So you see a 3D figure there. You can play with that in the, in the actual lesson that's linked uh, here. But I'll send you a, a different interactive figure so that if you're on the Prismia side, you can sort of grab it and play with it. So this is a neural network and you can talk about things like, you know, what, what are the biases? What are the weights? How do they affect the way the network works? And it, you know, it's very tangible. You can see the specific values here. You can click this button to come up with a really good neural net that's actually going to flip the little thumb so that it's always, uh, almost always turned up. Uh, over there, kind of guessing correctly which side of the point the line is on. Sorry, which side of the, the uh, curved line here the point is on. Um, in any case, obviously, I don't want to get too much into that example just to show you sort of like what, uh, what, what we're going for here. Um, 
yeah, and so anyone can create and distribute these Prismia lessons for free right now. There's no barrier to doing that. Uh, it's very much designed to be as user-friendly as possible. So you can do uh, all of these things without coding. This particular interactive figure did involve coding and I think it would be fairly hard to build without it. Um, but, but simpler stuff, there is a, a graphical user interface um, for, for these sorts of things that I'm leveraging here. That's a different project called Sketchometry. It's not like I built all this stuff from scratch, but um, I'm, I'm trying to sort of pull it all together in one place. Yeah, so in any case, that, that's all, all I wanna say for now about me and the projects that I'm up to. I want to kind of back out and talk about the, the general landscape of data science tools and talk about learning resources and then talk about where you can plug in and, and uh, get some data science community uh, if that's not something you have already. So yeah, so just quick overview for some, some common data science tools uh, just for, for purposes of orientation. So I would say probably the, the single most common or most popular data science tool at this point is Python and, and specifically the scientific computing ecosystem around Python. Uh, this is a popular choice. I, I think at this point, mostly for reasons of inertia, it, it caught on and it's, it started to become popular. And then at some point that was enough, for, enough reason for it to continue to become popular. Um, but that's really useful for people to come together around common tooling. And, and uh, one of the, the factors I think driving its influence early on is that it, it was popular for other tasks first. So you can do data science in Python, then you can apply that Python knowledge to do other adjacent tasks that might come up along the way without having to switch contexts into some different, completely different stack of tooling uh, to, to perform other tasks. So uh, this might be very basic for many folks, but the way that Python works is that you write code and that code that you write, when you run it, it, you'll, it will manipulate data and produce visualizations or train models or whatever data science task you wanna perform. Um, this I think should actually be said, it's not inevitable. There are tools that do not involve writing code. Um, and, and Python is not one of them. You write code to make things happen. That, that's the workflow. Um, another popular choice, which it involves a very similar workflow and, and, a, and a similar mode of thinking, I think in, in most cases for most tasks uh, is R. So these are really the two big ones, Python and R. And R is especially popular among statisticians. It was originally popularized as the sort of lingua franca of statistics. And it's been very successful in that role. Um, and it's very much focused on statistics. So unlike Python, which is general, and, and has a much broader community outside of the data science world. Statistics, sorry, R does not so much. It's really um, very much focused on statistics. So that's an advantage and a disadvantage. They can tailor the language to the application very nicely in a way that's sometimes a little clunky with Python. On the other hand, when you need to do something that R is not really well set up to do, you, you probably will have to switch languages to really do that in a sensible way. So just by comparison, uh, to, to, for concreteness here, this is how you would make the same little scatter plot in, in R. So you can see there's some commonalities, X equals sepal width, just like up here, we had X equals sepal width so that they're drawing from a, a sort of, you know, similar set of underlying ideas, but then there are also some differences in how the, the code is structured. So we have, so we have 18 folks participating on the Prismia side. So I can ask you, a quick question, which is, uh, do you have experience doing data science in Python or R? So I'll give folks a, a second to select one of those answer choices and then I'll, I'll share the results. Yeah, so I'll share the, the summary here. So um, al almost everyone has some experience with Python, a lot of people exclusively Python and a couple exclusively R. So that, that makes sense, I think. Um, that's pretty, uh, it feels like pretty representative. Um, you know, if you if you had a lot more sort of pure stats people, there'd be more R only answers. But um, yeah, that 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 makes sense to me. Um, I'll, I'll mention here that there are some very nice data science tools that that don't involve writing code or involve writing very little code, 
And, and these are actually, uh, you know, from a certain point of view, thinking of data science tooling more broadly, um, they're much more popular. Like Excel, you know, there are many more Excel users than, than Python users. Um, but that, that does require sort of a broad construal of what, what data science is. And there's some dashboarding tools like Tableau, and these things are explicitly designed for you to be able to sort of grab your data and do stuff with it without having to write uh, code. And, and I think it is worth acknowledging that sometimes those tools are the right tool for the job. But most people who are going to get really into data science, uh, they're, you're going to do the vast majority of your work through code. And that's because you're going to have better flexibility to do more, uh, more of exactly what you want. Uh, the ability to share your work and make sure that it runs the same for you and for someone else and for yourself a year from now, uh, those those kinds of tools are there. Whereas it it tends to be much harder to achieve those things with some of these approaches that are not um, really uh, you know code based. Um, so that's why you see Python and R really dominating this space uh, for kind of you know serious data science usage. Um, if there's anyone who is sort of thinking about getting into data science and is weighing the Python versus R question, my main advice would just be to identify what's more popular in the specific application domain you have in mind and, and do that. So the, the availability of, of packages and tooling is going to be much stronger for your particular subdomain, whatever it might be, whatever it might be um, typically. I mean, there may be a few things where they're about equal, but um, often when, when there's a community sort of specializing in something, they'll, they'll kind of settle on, on one tool or the other. And that's going to be more important than, than the, I would say, mostly rather cosmetic language differences between the two. So I'd like to share just kind of a, a list of, of links and, and other, um, you know, some, some commentary on those links. It's not exhaustive, you know, I don't mean anything by omitting any particular resource here. There's just a few of my favorite things to refer people to. So for Python, my, my favorite intro to data science based on Python is Aurelien Jerome's book, Hands-On Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn Keras and TensorFlow. So that's a really long, unwieldy title that I never remember verbatim, but uh, it, it's an amazing book. It's, uh, he does a very nice job of really developing the concepts from the ground up, kind of pointing out things to you along the way that you're going to be curious about and, and kind of anticipating well what the sticking points are going to be, the necessary caveats and so on. So this is uh, really, a, I think, a superb resource. This is my top recommendation for people who are just getting started and they want just kind of one, one single thing to look at. Um, if you if you want something that is lighter than that, because that is a full fledged book, it's quite quite a serious in time investment. Then th there's something that I built here on, on Data Gymnasia called the Data Science Pipeline, and this is a Python based course. You know, it's interactive. It's fairly brief. The idea is just to introduce you to the, the really the core ideas, and that's it. So you want to go through this and. Get, get some some solid orientation, learn the basic ideas, and, and then seek another resource to learn things that, that are gonna be more in depth and maybe more specific to what you particularly wanna do. Uh, one kind of nice thing about that is it does, uh, these code cells run in the browser. Um, I mean, actually they run in my binder servers, but the point is you don't have to install anything. And so there's some check for understanding questions along the way and so on some you know, animated GIFs explaining some points and, and so on. I, I think it's, um, you know, it, it does a reasonable job of what it's trying to do. If you're not ready to jump into data science with Python because you feel like you want to learn Python better first, I think that's a totally reasonable approach. There's also a fairly lightweight, but you know, reasonably uh, broad introduction in data gymnasia that's linked here. And if you want a more uh, full-fledged course, then several students in the DSI have, in, in sort of anticipation for the, the program over the, the summer proceeding, they've done this MITx course called Introduction to Computer Science and Programming in Python. And everyone who's done it has very positive things to say about it. So I like to include that as well. Um, just a couple other things I'll mention kind of tagged on at the end here 
or How to Think Like a Computer Scientist, which is a free online book. It's, it's very long and it's not particularly oriented towards data science, but for learning programming, if you have the time and you wanna do it thoroughly, I think it's really a pedagogical masterpiece. And the Python Data Science Handbook by Jake Vanderplas is also very common uh, reference to include in, in such lists as these. It's, it's widely used, it's very nice, it's fairly succinct and, it, and it's uh, totally oriented towards the data science packages rather than kind of broader use cases. Um, yeah, so I'll just, even though there weren't a lot of people into R, I'll just mention the R resources that I have here as well. And I actually, I really like these a lot. So my favorite book, full stop, is this book by uh, Rafik Irizarry at Harvard uh, that was built over the last uh, two or three years. And uh, it, it's, it's in R. It's, it's very, very nice. It's a, it, for an introduction to statistics and data science, um, you know, if, you, if you're willing to, to use R, I think this, uh, or so, you know, if you're gonna use R anyway, I think this resource is, it was, it's, it's almost a, a, a deciding factor for what to learn first, if you do wanna learn both, um, because it's just so good. It, it also builds up the basics of R programming alongside the data science skills. So you don't need to learn all the programming stuff first and then bring that general knowledge to, to your data science learning. Um, if you are interested in that book, but prefer videos to, to, book, to a book, at least the first uh, sort of 10-ish hours worth of video are available through a winter course that I did over the summer, or sorry, over the winter. <laughs> That's redundant. A winter course I did, um, did this year. And um, we recorded the videos for that. So there are links there to, to all the videos there on YouTube. <clears throat> um, there's another book besides that one that is, uh, I feel I can't really leave off, which is Hadley Wickham's R for Data Science. So Hadley is a, you know, major figure in the R world, maybe, you know, the, the biggest figure in the R world. And so this book, which ha has had a lot of effort go into it, it's also very valuable pedagogically. I think it's very well done. Um, th this is another great place to look, uh, to learn. Uh, to learn R for data science. Okay, so one other thing that I'll add here, which normally wouldn't be mentioned, I think, but this is sort of me uh, inserting my own um, sort of my, my own my own preferences here. That there's a there's a common experience people have when they do data science, where they they kind of learn how the packages work. They can, they learn how to make certain types of figures or certain types of um, <clears throat> analyses happen using packages and tutorials. But then there's a the question, how do I interpret this? How do I know what this data is really telling me beyond sort of, you know, some hand-waving analogy at kind of at, at a high level that is trying to give you some way to think about what you're looking at. In, in often case, in, in, in many cases, the obstacle there is a deeper mathematical understanding. And for that reason, one of the distinctives that we try to maintain in the Brown DSI master's program is that we do develop this mathematical foundations quite a bit. And this is often intimidating to folks, but I think that many of these ideas really are actually quite accessible as long as they're presented in a way that's not assuming in advance that you're uh, someone who, who has an ex extensive math training coming into it. Um, so that, that involves putting more effort into making right visualizations or accompanying computational explorations. But once it's done, it, it is able to um, kind of re reach more people, I think, than a, a, an approach to presenting that's very based on, you know, formulas and, and um, assuming that the reader can kind of glean mathematical insight from, you know, complex algebraic expressions and so on. We try to do things quite differently in the DSI. So I'll, I'll mention a couple of learning resources that I think have done this really well, ap apart from things that we've built. So one is called Math for Machine Learning. That's a very popular book that was introduced quite recently. And uh, another one it, that I found just looking around in the internet is a Coursera course called Math for Machine Learning from 
uh, University College London, that is, it's been, been around a bit longer and it's got videos and exercises and stuff. It's also quite good um, from what I can tell. I haven't, I, I haven't worked through it piece by piece, but the, the parts that I've looked at seem, seem quite good. Um, and then, yeah, of course, you know, I've put a lot of effort in this direction as well. So I'm going to point you to the, those resources. So really kind of almost all of the data gymnasia resources, other than the ones I've mentioned so far, I would say fit under this heading. We start all the way back at, at sets and functions. Uh, we develop linear algebra. The multivariable calculus course is quite sparse. It really is designed for someone who's had that course and is looking for a, a refresher. Um, and that's all, but these other resources are, they're, reasonably thorough, um, I think, if for the most part. And uh, th they're going to be developing a lot of these visual aids that, that I mentioned. Um, in addition to the data gymnasia stuff, I'll also give you a link here for the course table for data 1010. So that's going to include the data gymnasia readings, but that's just one column. You're also going to have a video here with an accompanying Jupyter notebook and then a Prismia script that goes with the class for that day. Um, there's really uh, an enormous amount of stuff here. So this, I think, switches from being less extensive than a real course to being, I think, more content uh, overall than you would typically have, or, or that really even fits actually in a, in a course. This is, um, there's a lot there. Um, and to help you navigate that, since it is a lot, uh, I, I have a cheat sheet that I'll link here and I had to kind of zoom in on it to give you a clip and give you a sense of what it looks like. But uh, it's kind of just a quick overview of everything else that's there. So that can be helpful potentially as just an orientation or, or um, you know, to give you a sense of what specific ideas we cover in that course uh, without you having to, you know, dig into all those different resources. Um, yeah, so I'm almost, almost through the presentation here uh, just one more section, which is about community. So a, a lot of the resources I have to share in general are sort of built around the idea that you're going to study independently. But of course, community is important as well. And I'll just share share a few ideas in that direction. So one is that Kaggle is kind of, uh, you know, sort of the, the canonical central hub in some sense of data science on the internet. There are challenges there but also a lot of data sets. There are computational notebooks you can run in the browser, uh, discussion forums, uh, links to other learning resources and so on. There, there's a lot of good stuff there and you can, you can plug in there um, if, if that's something you're interested in. Twitter is another uh, way to kind of have your, have your thumb on the pulse. Um, so I've just shared a few of uh, the people that I follow. Uh, this is, you know, not again, not meant to be any kind of canonical list, just to, a small selection of people and you can follow those people and see who they've retweeted and, and kind of build up a collection of, of folks to listen to there. But I, I do find that very useful um, personally. Um, on campus, there's uh, Discov, which is a, a sequence of talks um, uh, that, that Carney organizes uh, at lunchtime on Fridays. It, it's very nice. It's, it's aimed at, you know, so it's sort of supposed to be introductory. Uh, based on the website, it looks like that is expected to resume in the fall. Um, the Brown Data Science Club hosts datathons and workshops and other events. Again, that's probably the sort of thing that it's going to be more of a resource once um, you know the the pandemic situation uh, shifts further. And um, I would encourage encourage you to sign up for the Brown DSI mailing list uh, because there's. And there are announcements that go out about talks and seminars and, and that sort of thing. There are also some, some free Prismia mini courses like the one I mentioned before uh, uh, over, over this winter. Also every summer, there's some, some things in that direction. And so those will be announced on the DSI mailing list. I, I, I'll give you a link here. You can just, you know, it's like clicking through slides or whatever, you can access uh, this sequence of messages without having to go back into your Prismia account with, with this link. 